my name is Sławomir Dębski. I'm director of the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding, the institution established by the Act of Polish Parliament <coughs> to enhance communication between Polish and Russian societies to facilitate debate on Russia with Russia. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome all of you to the conference the case of Crimea in the light of international law, its nature and implications, which uh, we have honored, honored uh, to organize jointly with uh, a very prestigious institution, uh, the Institute of Law Studies of the Polish Academy of Science, and Professor Wodimir Czapliński. I welcome him uh, uh, very warmly. Uh, without this institution, we probably would not be able to get you all together in this place, in this moment. I remember very well uh, the moment when I, the idea of this conference crossed my mind first time. It was exactly a year ago, and I was uh, um, invited uh, to one uh, TV program and asked to uh, give a comment on the famous ceremony which um, took place in the Kremlin and the speech of President um, of Russian Federation on the occasion of uh, incorporation, so-called incorporation Crimea into the Russian Federation. I realized in that moment that uh, we all are turning into troubled waters. Russia in the first place, but we all are um, inviting great troubles. Um, if we, civilized, civilized nations, stick to the principles that we don't use the force against each other unilaterally, that we don't change borders without the consent of all parties, and that we don't apply the concept of the sphere of influence because of the good memory of the two great wars that took place in Europe in 20th century. And all of that was somehow questioned. So I immediately uh, um, called to, uh, to Wodek and asked whether he would be interested to do it together. So now uh, we'll have a floor for a debate about the nature and consequences of the event of the last year. Uh, and I would uh, like all of you to contribute in good spirit uh, and good regime of intellectual regime provided by international law. Uh, we have also enormous pleasure and honor to uh, have among us um, Professor Artur Novak Far, and I would like all of you to welcome him specially with applause. And and few few comments, few comments, uh, intro, introductory comments before I give um, him a floor. We met first time 12 years ago in Moscow, actually. It was a conference on EU-Russia relationship and its prospects. Uh, Professor Arthur novak Farr is a very well-known expert in international law and particularly European law, uh, very well-known in Poland and also in Europe. So it is, uh, I think, uh, an honor also for Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, of having you at this post, Arthur. And uh, we are also very pleased that you find time to share your thoughts and what, let's say, the Polish state thoughts on the issue of today's conference. So, without the further delay, I would like to pass the floor to Professor Artur Novak Far, Under Secretary of State in the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Artur, the floor is yours. Well, because of the nice words uh, which has already been uh, expressed, or spoken, and because of the place I'm right now, I feel unduly alleviated. <laughs> 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, allow me to start off with thanking the organizers, the Center for uh, Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding, and the Institute of Law Studies uh, of the Polish Academy of Sciences. First, for inviting me to the conference and giving me uh, both the opportunity and honor to address to you these opening remarks. Secondly, more importantly, for hosting this conference, which is for sure a timely event. Its timeliness is twofold. It is probably no coincidence that the conference take place now as we now have, uh, have it. If I may put it this way, an anniversary of the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Moreover, the consequences stemming from that illegal act uh, still continue to produce effects of both political and legal nature. In the European discourse, the case of Crimea, or to be more precisely, the annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation, is nowadays sometimes overshadowed by the events in the eastern Ukraine. It is all the more important not to forget about this incident, which, in our view, constituted a flagrant violation of international law. For the first time since the Second World War, one European state appropriated territory of another state without the consent of the latter. What is even more perplexing, the aggressor was precisely the same state which only a few years before, in the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, had solemnly declared that it would respect the independence and sovereignty of the existing borders of Ukraine. I do not intend, nor uh, uh, will I be able to fully elaborate on the details of how and why international law was breached in the case of Crimea. I think this is your job. Uh, I'm convinced, however, that because this is your job, uh, all the following speakers would completely and competently address this issue. I would simply like to draw your attention to the opinion by a legal advisory committee to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland on the annexation of the Crimea Peninsula to the, Europe, uh, to the uh, Russian Federation in light of international law which is a document available on the Foreign Ministry's website. It clearly explains why I speak of the annexation of Crimea as an act contrary to international law. Many legal analyses point out in the same direction as the one formulated by the uh, uh, advisory committee. Despite that fact, or maybe because of that, for some, the annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation may be considered as a failure of international law. Another proof that international law is not a real thing. According to this view, in international relation, it is just the power that really counts. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must," wrote Thucydides, describing the statement of Athenian empire to Melos, small island in the southern Aegean during the Second Peloponnesian War. Nevertheless, I'm sure that this conference would prove that international law has applied 
Mobutu and worked also in the case of Crimea, as well as continues to define the legal parameters concerning the consequences of the annexation. Maybe indeed international law did not prevent its flagrant violation, but still, violation of law do not invalidate its very nature of being ours, bonnie, and equi, that is being the art of something good and equitable. Also, it is worthwhile to look at how the international society and hence international law reacted to the annexation of Crimea. In this regard, I would like to draw your attention to three points. First of all, the parlance, the language being used. The language that we speak to a large extent expresses the ideas that we believe in. In this context, I think that it is important to un underline that the debate following the annexation of Crimea, of which this conference is a wonderful example, has been framed in the international law narrative. Statements presenting view of state and international organizations qualify this act as violation, annexation. They also underline the necessity to respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, as well as highlighted the principle of non-intervention. Even the representatives of the Russian Federation spoke about the principle of self-determination and recognition of governments, presumably purporting to find a legal basis for the annexation. In this context, Sufis it to say that the right to the so-called external self-determination, if applies at all, it does so in very unique circumstances. It was after all Russia that represented the view to the International Court of Justice in the proceedings concerning the advisory opinion on accordance with international law of the unilateral declaration of independence in respect of Kosovo, that the above mentioned right uh, arises in truly extreme circumstances such as an outright armed attack of the parent state threatening the very existence of the people in question. This was clearly not the case of Crimea. Secondly, non-recognition. Many states, including the Republic of Poland and international organizations, adopted a firm legal position not to recognize the legal annexation of the Crimea. United Nations General Assembly Resolution Number 68 uh, 262 adopted on the 27th of March 2014 clearly called upon all states, international organizations, and specialized agencies not to recognize any alteration of the status of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. It is in particular in this context that Poland, during the 2014 session of the 6th Committee of the General Assembly, introduced a proposal that the International Commission undertook new topic on the duty of non-recognition as lawful a situation created by a serious breach by a state of an obli obligation arising under a peremptory norm of general international law. Poland underlined that the duty of non-recognition should be considered as an essential legal instrument of international community in preserving the rule of law. We hope that the International Law Commission would accept the Polish proposal and elaborate on it, thus contributing to the efforts of uh, the international community related to the enforcement of international law. 
Thirdly, sanctions. Many states and international organizations imposed sanctions or so-called restrictive measures against Russia in order to express their protest against flagrant violation of international law and to introduce Russia to abide, induce by Russia to abide by uh, its international obligations. As it was stated by the Polish foreign minister, Grzegorz Schetyna, to the EU ambassadors in uh, his recent address, I quote, we believe that a continuation of the current EU policy, including sanctions, is the best way to change Russia's behavior. And a other approach uh, will be perceived as a weakness and uh, used by Russia against us. The end of quotation. Ladies and gentlemen, Regrettably, the annexation of Crimea and the ongoing Russian intervention in the eastern Ukraine reminds us that there is no end to the history in Eastern Europe. Nevertheless, the definitely is future. It definitely involves respect for the rule of law and international commitments. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts on this important issue and please allow me to wish you very fruitful deliberations at this conference. I uh, certainly hope that your discussions will contribute to our understanding of the Crimea conundrum and uh, will shed more light on how best to approach it. I wish you all the success. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as co-organizer of this conference, I would also use that opportunity to, to welcome you uh, in Warsaw. Uh, and I do hope that we'll uh, have here a nice, interesting and fruitful uh, time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, introduction, uh, which represents in a way an official position of the government of the Republic of Poland. Uh, and in a way also an official position of the uh, European Union uh, towards the events in uh, uh, Crimea and uh, Eastern Ukraine. Uh, I would like to emphasize, however, that the purpose of this conference was to gather together uh, people representing different options, different countries and different opinions. Uh, even if the position of the European Union is formally uniform, we know that the Union is in a way divided uh, on several issues, uh, taking into account the economic interests of some states which are uh, more uh, or deeper engaged in the commercial relations with, uh, uh, with both Russia and Ukraine. Uh, by the way, we have tried by uh, picking up a number of interesting uh, topics, we have to leave aside some actual issue which uh, uh, arise uh, just now, including commercial arbitration concerning investments in Crimea and similar issues, extremely interesting, but unfortunately we have only uh, two days uh, uh, for this uh, discussion. Uh, as to a formal uh, approach to, to our conference, uh, we have decided to uh, organize four panels, uh, half day each, and they will be, uh, those panels will be devoted to uh, the most 
interesting and important issues of the, um, of the conflict. Uh, we would like to uh, give to the panelists, well, 15 minutes for their presentations. We are flexible depending upon time, but we would like also to leave uh, as much time as possible for discussion. Uh, we have two categories of, of, of speakers, as you probably have seen in our program. Uh, panelists which were invited by the organizers, uh, discussants who were uh, who proposed their uh, presentations and we found uh, those presentations interesting uh, for a larger uh, for the larger uh, public and then uh, everyone is invited to uh, take part in discussion asking questions and commenting uh, upon what what has been uh, said I would like uh, to start now, as we are uh, pretty on time, surprisingly. Uh, I would like, uh, that's very optimistic, because usually in most conferences, uh, delays are present since the very first presentation. Uh, so we'll try to keep uh, our, our time. I would like to invite uh, the first panelists, uh, please take your seats and then I will continue from my presidential chair.